Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar on uh, TMJ Awareness. I'm your host, Dr. Ira, for the evening. Welcome to everyone. A few announcements before we begin. Please refrain from using the raised hand, but type your comments and questions in the Q&A tab, and I will attend to them via this tab. CPD certificates will be loaded to the SADA platform, and you'll be able to access them all your certificates under your member profile. If you are not a SADA member, you will still be able to create a profile for yourself and access your CPD certificates. Tonight's event qualifies for one clinical CEU point. We are also streaming live on YouTube, um, just in case you have difficulty in accessing the Zoom platform. Please remember to complete the evaluation after the webinar. Tonight's webinar will be on TMJ and awareness, and our presenter for that is Dr. Mark Mayer. A little bit about Dr. Mark Mayer before I give you hand over to him. Dr. Mark Mayer is the founder and director of the Facial and Oral Surgery Private Clinic situation in northern suburbs in, be in the beautiful Cape Town. He founded the clinic in order to offer all his party, uh, patients superior services with the most technological advancements in the field of maxillofacial and oral surgery. Dr. Mayer is a board certified and fellow of the College of Maxillofacial and Oral Surgeons in South Africa. He obtained his dental degree from the University of Stellenbosch. He continued to pursue his interest in oral surgery and obtained his postgraduate diploma at the University of Pretoria and honors degree in oral surgery at the University of Western Cape. Dr. Mark Mayer not only obtained his training in South Africa, but was awarded the prestigious AOCMF fellowship and the opportunity to train in Austria where he pursued his passion in temporal mandibular joint surgery. He also obtained a mini residency fellowship in arthroscopic TMJ surgery under world renowned arthroscopic TMJ surgeon, Dr. McCain. He was invited to the Biomed Institute in Jackson, uh, where he trained on TMJ replacement surgery. He is therefore trained in the full scope of temporal mandibular joint disorders and serves as a consultant TMJ surgeon at Curtis Kiel Hospital. Currently is pursuing his PhD degree, focusing on the impact of genetics on the etiology of temporal mandibular joint disorders. Dr. Mayer was further rewarded with the Golden Key International Society Award for his outstanding academic achievements and is registered member of the society. He obtained his MBA from the prestigious University of Stellenbosch Business School. Dr. Mayer has published and lectured both locally and internationally in the field of maxillofacial and oral surgery. His PhD thesis combines genetic and, temp uh, genetic and temporal mandibular joint disorders and will provide support for the future of, the precision, of precision medicine. Dr. Mayer, good evening. I'd like to hand over you for your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Hira. Thank you for that kind words. I'm going to share my screen now. Do you see that, Dr. Hira? I can see you. I can see your screen. All right. So thank you, Dr. Hira, for the kind words, for the kind introduction. Um, dear colleagues, thanks. Uh, thank you, Sada for this opportunity to discuss um, my field of interest in temporal mandibular joint disorders. And today I just want to touch on a few points regarding the diagnosis and that subsequent treatment of temporal mandibular joint disorders. So let's just put this, why is this such a big problem? Um, you know, or how big is the problem? Let's look at a few studies. The study says that at least a third of the general population will have at least one symptom of, of a TMD. Um, and around about 7% of those patients will have a discomfort to eventually go and seek treatment. And it might not be to the dentist, but it might be to other specialities, but 7% of them will go and seek treatment. And therefore, because there's so many people involved, I think, you know, the diagnosis or the accurate diagnosis uh, sometimes is not found. And therefore, then the patient goes on various treatment for temporal mandibular joint disorders. Um, it is also equally important to know then when not to treat these patients with specific treatment protocols. So the why and the how of 
of treating patients with temporal mandibular disorders becomes important. Let's look at the South African setup. I looked at, uh, I just Googled and, and found that in 2021, stats SA say there's 60 million people in South Africa. Now, if you take the previous slide information, it looks like 19.85 million people will have at least one sign of TMD. If you take 3% or 7% of that 33%, it looks like 1.4 million people will seek some sort of help for the, for the TMJ problem. They, I think in, in uh, one of the stats that I saw in 2018, 19, there was around about 6,400 dentists in South Africa. So if those 1.4 million people come to us, it seems like our practice will have around about 218 patients that we need to see. Uh, that's around about one patient every day that's going to knock on your door seeking help for a TMD disorder. Um, only a very small amount needs to be seen by the maxillofacial surgeon that needs surgery. That's around about 1%. So the problem is there. Um, my question is, are we just aware? Are we aware of that problem and managing our patient effectively? Let's look at a few theories. It's, uh, um, this is always interesting to, to see um, because based on the theory that was current in our maybe in our training or what we treat or what we uh, uh, um, believe in uh, from those theories we got treatment option and it's funny enough in the history of temporal mandibular disorders um, it actually came from an ENT surgeon Dr. Koston that saw patients that present with preauricular pain they had some sort of a loss of the posterior dentition. And he then recommended that those patients go and seen by the dentist. And so the dentist's focus at that stage was to, to manipulate the occlusion uh, as a treatment option for, for assisting patients with temporal mandibular joint disorders. Over the many years, these theories has evolved and currently the psychosocial, the biopsychosocial model is the accepted model if we're looking at the origin of, of temporal mandibular disorders. And because that is now currently the accepted model, our treatment philosophies and our treatment options that we present to our patient has also evolved from only looking at the occlusion to looking at other factors that might impact our treatment plan. So the temporal mandibular disorder has got many faces, depending on who is seeing the patient. You know, if it's the MaxFac, uh, if it's the dentist, uh, if it's the, the ENT, if it's the neurologist, all of us are presented with this patient. So the, the temporal mandibular joint is really a multidisciplinary joint. Um, a lot of people can assist the patient to getting the same end result, and that is to help the patient out of his out of his disorder and discomfort. If you're looking at one of the classifications that we've got now, classifications comes about we we would like to 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 have some sort of a form, some sort of a treatment guide, some sort of to how to get to your diagnosis. And these classification systems helps us a lot. And one of the classification that's in our literature is basically we divide the TMD condition is either it's an extra articular problem um, and, and the most common one is muscle disorders or it is a intra-articular problems. And you can see there's a lot of them, but the most common one that we will see in our practice is internal derangement. Um, so, but don't be blindsided with, with this because TMD, TMD also falls into other classification that we might not have all the knowledge about, like in the headache society, you will see TMD as well uh, coming up in that classification. Also in facial pain uh, and chronic pain disorders, you will see TMD also coming in, in that. So, but having a classification assists us with that. Um, with all these various theories, uh, you know, a group of, 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 of specialists from various disciplines that came together and you can get, it's this nice information on the website, it's the diagnostic criteria of temporal mandibular disorders. 
they came out and say yes uh, let's there is some other factors that 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 influence the diagnosis of these patients with temporal mandibular disorders and they group it into an axis one and an axis two well the axis one is basically what we already know it, it, it's it's the problem that the patient presents is the biomechanical problem that we know uh, and that we will taught uh, and basically group one is your muscle disorders we have group two is your internal derangement disorders and your group, group three could be classified as all your degenerative disorders and and these are the order uh, these are the X is one we are seeing in our, in our other classification systems. But looking at X is two, that has become very important in managing our patient nowadays is, is something that we are all not trained in, you know, to recognize the patient with depression or to recognize patient with non-specific physical symptoms, to recognize patient that's got chronic pain syndrome um, and, and, and with, with a decreased jaw limitation score. Now, these factors has a great impact on eventually on how our outcome of our treatment is. And here we will have further discussion along the way. So making your diagnosis now is not only focused on, on, on biomechanical problems, but also quite a lot of a psychosocial impact as well. So getting to the diagnosis is not only always a straight road and getting to the diagnosis, uh, you should take your time and, and getting to a correct diagnosis and therefore then treating the patient optimally. You know, no matter how long the road is, uh, you know, you need to tell the patient this is normally not a quick fix, but you will be with them all the way. Um, I'm not going to bore how do we get to a diagnosis. We know we go through this diagnostic protocol, we, we listen to the chief complaint, we, we discuss the history of the main complaint, we look at the dental, the medical, and also very important, the psychosocial history um, before we get to the clinical examination. An extra added benefit for us is to have a biobehavioral assessment forms with us. And, and, and that can help us later on if we are not so familiar with, with topics like stress, anxiety, depression, and all that stuff. You can fill these forms in, and with our second visit, you might want to discuss issues that you've picked up. You can tell a look to the patient. You, 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 you scored a little bit high on, on anxiety. Let's talk about that. And you will see, you know, those discussion normally comes out 20, 30 minutes later within your, within your uh, um, history taken. But it's very important because those factors will play a role in the final outcome of your treatment plan. So it's all about, it's all about gathering data when you see the patient in the first time. Take your time with him because these patients, um, um, you need to listen to them um, before making a, a quick diagnosis and say, you've got a TMD. TMD is too broad to say that you've got a TMD. You need to be much more specific and get to an appropriate diagnosis before commencing a treatment. Looking at this patient here, yeah, um, depending on, on, on who the patient comes to see, you know, if, if he comes to see a max factor with maybe a plaster on the nose, uh, you will see, you might think, ah, oh, maybe a fracture mandible. If you see a dentist, he might see, ah, oh, this is an upper, uh, maybe tooth abscess. And if he sees a, a physician or a neurologist, he might think it's facial pain. That is just by looking at the patient. Um, we sometimes get too quick into making a diagnosis. So we just look at the patient, he points us to something and then we make a diagnosis. If it comes to temporal mandibular joint disorders, we should look much further than that. Um, it's not only a dental issue. Um, it's not only a facial issue. We're sitting with a whole patient in front of us. And there's a saying that the clinician who only looks at the occlusion is missing as much as the clinician who never looks at the occlusion. 
So when it comes to the etiology, we are very good in our knowledge with biological, how that disorder came about. Um, but if we are not trained in the other factors, like the patient as a whole, what environment is the patient finding itself in? What is his social circumstances, his emotional circumstances? That falls under the new um, uh, seeing that the biopsychosocial model is now the theory that we stand with as part of the origins of temporomandibular joint disorders. And our treatment must also have something to do with assisting patients in managing the psychosocial part of the problem as well. A little bit about the pathogenesis. Uh, this, is, this is just out of a textbook. The part that I want to emphasize here is the familiarities between some of the factors that's right on top. Those three circles at top. We can see uh, 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 a, it's muscle disorders, B, it's intra-articular disorders, but those three circles are present in both. And these are the factors that we need to look at when we manage the patient. And I will make it clear that you can see that those factors cause an altered either a muscle or an altered biomechanical uh, a problem with the patient. But on the other side, the symptoms and the signs that the patient presents is exactly the same. They, they, they will complain about pain, they will complain of an altered jaw movement, and they will have joint sounds. So what is important is the successful management of the temporal mandibular disorder is very much dependent on identifying and controlling those contributing factors. And this we will find out only if we do a good history taking. When we ask the patient, when did this disorder start? When did you realize you have this problem? And with discussing the patient, you will find out he might have predisposing factors that increase the risk of TMD. Those factors need to be identified and form part of your treatment plan. Otherwise, you're only going to treat the symptom and the patient will be back with pain again. Sometimes there's initiating um, um, factors, you know, it caused the onset of temporal mandibular disorders. Uh, and also very important, uh, these perpetuating factors that can interfere with healing or even enhance the progression uh, of these disorders. For an example, uh, patient that, that present with bruxism. Um, um, the old thinking was that bruxism is a dental problem. Uh, the new thinking now is bruxism is a dental manifestation of a medical problem. So yes, bite splint therapy can assist, uh, but it's not a treatment for bruxism. It's basically uh, assisting to lower the damage that this patient's underlying um, central medical problem, um, the, the impact it has on the teeth and on the temporal mandibular joint. That's why there is a benefit for a patient uh, to wear a bite spin therapy. So we need to identify these factors if we, in our history taken, taking. The patient will come into us and he will start talking. He will tell, tell you what the problem is. The patient will provide us with a lot of information. He will tell us his symptoms. And what is a symptom? The symptom is any sign of which the patient is aware of. Now, we as a clinician, we need to take that data and put that symptom to one of the TMD signs that is known to us to say, yes, um, um, you do have a TMD problem, listening to your main complaint. I have put this main complaint and find that yes, it fits into certain temporal mandibular disorders. And these signs and symptoms can be basically packed together in three categories. Patient will, will complain about pain, the patient will complain about joint sounds, and the patient will complain of some sort of jaw dysfunction. 
And those three points you need to put down on your history taken because with your treatment, your treatment will have to address pain, sounds, and dysfunction. And the patient will, will, will that is what you're going to ask the patient every time when you visit and when you want to see um, um, what is your treatment outcome and is your treatment benefiting the patient. You, will, you should have decrease in pain, uh, decrease in sounds, uh, and a better mouth opening. Um, if you ask me what is the most important, uh, managing pain will give you a better mouth opening, and joint sounds is not normally um, so important because a third of the population has a clicking joint with no complications. So let's stop with pain. You know, if, if the patient says pain, then you need to ask a little bit more few questions about pain. You'll need to ask him about the quality of the pain. Where is the pain? The patient can be showing his finger is right at the joint or a more generalized area. Please also on that day score the point. Ask the pain from a visual analog score, how much will you score the pain today? What is your worst day and what is your better day? because that information will also assist you in to see if your treatment is working. Ask him about when did the pain start, the duration, the pattern. Ask the patient what makes the pain better, what makes the pain worse, how long is the pain there, because there you will see a difference because is this an acute problem or is this a chronic problem? And also then look at comorbid signs and symptoms for the patient. Uh, very important to look at depression, anxiety, as it goes with visual changes, dizziness, a numb area or generalized pain um, um, that might need further uh, investigations um, to, a, to, to get to a diagnosis. Now, your examination starts the time the patient walks into your room and greet you, and you do the look, listen, and feel approach. You look at him, you listen to the patient and eventually you will do your clinical examination. Well, your clinical examination should include some of these stuff. Uh, looking at the facial asymmetry, is there, a, is there asymmetry, is there swelling, is there inflammation? Um, ask the patient to open his, his mouth, what is his opening pattern? Is it smooth, uh, a straight pattern? Is there deviation of the mandible? Is there locking? and then a clicking, and then further mouth opening is the posturing of the patient. And measure the range of movement, not with your fingers. You know, don't say the patient got one finger breath or two fingers breath. Uh, take a ruler and measure it in millimeters. Because if you want to refer that patient later on, you know, our, our two fingers are not the same. And, 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 and millimeters, the rulers are, hopefully our rulers will be the same and, and, and we can then see, yes, there is success in the mouth opening or there is not. Palpate the joints, palpate the muscles, the trigger points, and be very careful when you palpate muscles because you can actually palpate too hard um, um, and then cause the patient pain and you will get a false diagnosis from those, uh, those type of patients. Every time when you do your palpation, ask the patient, is this pain familiar? Is this pain like the pain you are experiencing what you're talking about? And the patient will give you an idea. And obviously the intraoral examination that we are all familiar with, especially looking for signs of bruxism and clenching. Many of us have access to, to some investigation, special investigation, and the most common one that most of us have is, is, is a panorex, and here you can see bilateral condylar degenerative uh, disorders with these patients, um, but please, x-rays are looked at after your examination, because your examination alone will give you a lot of information and will probably take you more than halfway with your diagnosis. Your x-ray is just to confirm your, your suspicion. And nowadays, CBCT is used a lot often more than a panorex. Um, if you're looking at disc derangement, uh, I often ask for an MRI scan. And here I ask to look at the position of the disc, the morphology of the disc, 
I ask the patient to have an open and closed MRI done so that I can see if there is any reduction of the, of the disc or is this a non-reducing disc before um, having my final diagnosis to say to tell the patient what is wrong. Now let's uh, let's touch on, on on one of the most common disorders that 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 we find uh, the non-articular or the extra-articular DMT, and yeah, I will I will I will keep focusing on the muscular problems, and here yeah, on on the slide you can see these various uh, disorders that we that we dealt with. Um, I'll, I'm probably going to just look at the three of them that most commonly in my practice. Uh, if you diagnose the patient with, with myofascial pain, or before you get to the diagnosis, you know, your, your diagnostic criteria should be, I've palpated the patient and the patient has, has pain in one or more of his masticatory muscles, or it's tenderness, or is he present with trigger points. Uh, he might also have restricted mouth opening. And then you come to the conclusion that this patient suffers from myofascial pain. A myofascial pain it's in itself, by definition, is a chronic condition. So some of our, our acute um, therapeutic uh, treatment options um, might be beneficial for a very short time. Because this problem is, now, is sometimes chronic and the patient needs a little bit of a long term management with us. Um, local myalgia is the other one that, that, I, that I see often. And the, the, the term local myalgia and myospasm is sometimes confusing. Uh, you know, the patient tells you, I've got spasms in my, in my, in my, in my masseter muscles, and that's giving me the pain. Uh, you know, myospasm is actually a very rare acute condition and and it presents itself with involuntary and continuous muscle contraction and and for this condition you know normally the bite splint is not the treatment of choice here these other therapeutic uh, agents that we can use to manage myospasm but local myalgia is a different is is, is a different definition it's an acute muscle pain and we get this a lot with or without internal derangement. Um, um, it's, it's a protective mechanism where the muscles start to protect the joint sometimes and, 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 and th these ones and myofascial pain um, can be treated very successful with very conservative uh, treatments. Let's look at internal derangement of the TMJ, very other common uh, disorder that, that I see in my practice. And if you're looking at internal derangement, you need to know the functional anatomy of the TMD. You need to know, and the question you ask for the patient during your examination, you, sit, you should see the joint working within its space. And the temporomandibular joint is a compound joint. It consists of a condyle, it consists of a disc, and it consists of a fossa eminence uh, body. And we need to know when we ask the patient to open up, what happens there? There is a rotation happening and then followed by a translation happening. We need to have a few measurements in our head, right? The rotation will probably be around about 20 millimeters. And after that, there's some sort of a, of a translation happening. We need to know, all right, where is the click? Is it the late click? Is it the reciprocal click? Is it an early click? All that comes about when you know the knowledge, when you have knowledge of the anatomy of, of the temporomandibular joint and how it functions. And with knowing that, you can get to a diagnosis of internal derangement. And internal derangement um, within that concept, there is, there is different ones, uh, and we will get to it later. So when we're looking at internal derangement, it's basically a disrupted disarticular relationship that impairs joint function. It's like the disc of a brakes of, of a car. Uh, you know, if something goes wrong with that brake, trouble. Um, and so is also the function of the disc. So what happens to this disc? It says uh, in, in, in the literature at this stage, it says, you know, you've got excessive mechanical stress. And these 
that's this can lead to changes within the jaw uh, in the joint that results eventually in internal derangement. Again, I will come back to if we do not manage or understand what the mechanical stress is, those factors, if it's minor trauma, major trauma, developmental joint, or acquired joint disease, you cannot ultimately treat the patient successfully. So you need to manage and incorporate what causes this mechanical stress as part of your treatment plan. Let's look at minor, minor trauma again. This is normally the repetitive trauma that causes the internal derangement, clenching and bruxism, et cetera, like that. Um, but it's important to know what causes this or how did it cause and we get this in part of our examination. Uh, in our literature, uh, this is this, this, this what causes this mechanical stress. And I just want to point out again, a theory is, is, is introduced to us and we take that theory and we get a treatment option. Milan started to say that these mechanical stresses causes release of free, free radicals, it causes inflammatory mediators that cause this damage and then internal derangement. And what did we do? We say, let's attack this inflammatory mediators with anti-inflammatory medication. And so the success of arthrosynthesis with steroids started. And, and we did get very great results in the acute setting with patients that's got inflammatory uh, 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 disorders. Uh, then Litson came along and he, and, and, and he said, uh, you know, these mechanical stresses causes a reperfusion hypoxic uh, uh, dilemma that causes breakdown of hyaluronic acid. And this makes the joint sticky. Yeah, they call it the anchor dis phenomena. And then we thought about it and what did we do? We got, uh, and now we do arthrosynthesis and inject the hyaluronic acid in it to increase the lubrication, to wash out the joint of the inflammatory mediators and we get very good results for them. Please remember that, that temporal mandibular joint disorder might not be um, a one joint disorder. It might form part of systemic conditions uh, affecting the temporal mandibular joint disorder. So here we need to fall part of the team managing uh, the patient and we need to focus on our speciality if it's not dental or TMJ uh, or some or in others. But Normally, these patients are under the care of physicians or rheumatologists, etc. The diagnostic criteria of temporal mandibular disorders got very nice um, 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 decision tree or flow charts that we can use. And hopefully, by tonight, you can you can go and go to their website and go and go check this out. So, in summary, uh, if we just to just to look at the, how to get to the diagnosis. History taking is very, take your time with that history, examining the patient appropriately and getting to the diagnosis, taking in consideration access to the psychological impact that your treatment might have on the, on the current patient and the current situation. There's also decision trees for interarticular joint disorders and degenerative joint disorders. So let's look at the treatment modalities in short. Um, this treatment modality is, 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 is not a full list, but it's basically what, what we can uh, provide the patient um, currently in, in, in our settings. Uh, I do not prescribe that there's a one-size-fits-all uh, um, treatment pattern, like everybody will get it quite simply, everybody will have to give three months of non-surgery, everybody. It, it's very much individualized and the patient needs to be part of your treatment plan. And, 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 and you need to, to, to look at the diagnosis, get a diagnosis, and then choose from whatever you have available to you to manage this patient. And we'll go through a few of them. Um, when a patient presents to me and I need to, uh, I've made a diagnosis, uh, I look at the patient factors, I look at the resources that I've got available to me in the private sector, cost might be an issue, and I, and I do present the patient with basically three options. But most of the, most of the patient that presents 
to us will, will require some sort of a conservative management and most of the patient will, will, will do very well with the conservative management. A very small part of them need minimal intervention um, and, and, and a smaller part of that will need eventually open joint temporal mandibular surgery. If we're looking at the non-surgical management of these patients, um, I'm just gonna, gonna briefly go through this. Uh, my slide that I've got here, I have looked at what is available to me and you can see here that I can either prescribe something for the patient, there's my pharmacological option. I can um, assist them with some physical options. I can fabricate an oral appliance or I can refer the patient to have an oral appliance made. Um, some patients will benefit from biobehavioral therapy and a smaller lot will, 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 will benefit from from a dental uh, occlusion manipulation. So those are my, my groups that I have available to, to manage my patient non-surgically. It's important for me then also from the history to find out is this an acute setting or chronic setting? Because that's what I'm trying to do in the slide is to tell, is to tell us uh, you know, which medication would, will benefit the patient in an acute setting and what medication will benefit the patient in a chronic setting. And this is applied to the physical option, the oral appliance, the biobehavioral therapy, as well as uh, dental and oral manipulation. The ones in yellow with a question mark, this is where um, currently there's very, very, very weak research and, 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 and at this stage with that. But um, a lot of people uh, accept this as, 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 as treatment modalities, nothing wrong with it. But in the current literature, there's, there's very weak um, research that's done and that's, 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 that's telling us that it is definitely working for patients. But it is still an option that we can give patients. Let's look at another non-surgical modalities that we've got. Uh, and this is our old tradition that, uh, that dentists, that we as dentists focused on a lot. And uh, it, our, our treatment was solely based on the assessment and the correction of abnormalities on the occlusion. But now with new um, theories coming along, and there's, a, there's also our theories of, of the biopsychosocial uh, um, um, impact that it's got. And what is found on the literature um, that the literature does not support the usefulness of, occlus of occlusal equilibration. What I do find in my practice, a patient with premature contact, or when you ask the patient to close his mouth before he get maximal intercuspation, he shifts either laterally or medially. Those are the patients that will benefit from uh, occlusion manipulation. What about medication? If you do prescribe patients medication, you need to know uh, the pathways of pain and how it presents in patients with facial pain. Um, because prescribing uh, medication uh, can be ineffective and it could also be harmful for the patient. So you need to know uh, what the benefit of the patient is where in the pain pathway uh, you want to assist the patient with pain. The World Health Organization um, recommends that you, you, you use a step approach with managing patients with pain. Um, the anesthetist and the, and the pain specialist might differ, um, but to be safe, I'll always start with a non-opiate analgesic and maybe bite splint therapy, et cetera, and then increase as as you, you, you increase with more stronger opiates or even a weak opiate with a non-opiate, et cetera. But whatever you prescribe, you need to know why you're prescribing it, how the power will benefit the patient, the side effects, and on what level you are 
addressing the pain. Some of my therapeutic recommendations that I use, uh, the non-steroidals or the COX, especially in the acute setup, uh, I've got a few there on, on, on my third column, and those are the medications that I commonly prescribe for my patients. If the patient is primarily, uh, if the pain is primarily musculoskeletal and is still in the acute phase, around about two to four weeks, I also prescribe sometimes medication. And, and, and sometimes these patients will benefit from antidepressants um, definitely as well. Our chronic patients, our chronic TMD patients, uh, uh, I don't see quite a big need to prescribe non-steroidals in their cases. And therefore I change my medications to either benzo or some of these other uh, antidepressant, anticonvulsive, and, and a short uh, loading, not the loading, there's a short course of maybe an MDA receptor antagonist. But as soon as I start going into that uh, a medication, I do have a team to assist me with that. And I'm, I'm part of the facial uh, uh, pain clinic here uh, and also a neurologist that, uh, that manage these patients. So sometimes the patient will come back to you and say the treatment has failed. Um, um, don't be despondent. Look at to go back to your uh, to your to your initial consultations. Maybe look at your diagnosis as well. Also look at the patient, the compliance of the patient. You know, if you've given him ten tablets and he comes back with eight uh, two weeks later, um, you know, uh, what was the compliance of the patient? Uh, also, what was the expectation of the patient? Um, um, uh, you inform them that this is not a quick fix. Uh, if you're using the step up approach, they must know you're using the step up approach. If you lose, if you're using um, um, strong medications, you need to tell them this is the side effects. So, We seem to have lost Dr. May. I'm just going to see if I can get hold of him again. We are trying to get hold of Dr. Mayer. Please, could you give us five minutes while we try to reconnect him? I will be back with you guys shortly.
Hi everyone, Dr. Mayer has some technical issues on his side. He's just attempting to reconnect. I will keep you guys up to date. If we can please give him a few more minutes. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Yira. Can you hear me? Hi, Dr. Mayor. I can hear you. I am sorry for that issue. No um, problem. I can tell you. Um, if, you go where, to, if you go back to the presentation, I'll tell you where we lost you. Where we are, where did we um, end? Um, let me just see. Uh, uh, was it here? I can't see your presentation. Share your screen for okay, me. Okay, all right. Okay. Let me just um, share this quickly. Share the screen. Okay, just give me a minute. Okay. What are you seeing now? 
I'm seeing a presentation. All right, which we part? passed the slide here. Go to the next slide. Okay. No, go back. You're going too far forward. Go back. Go further back. Go back again. Go back again. You no, go on forward. You are you on your therapeutic recommendations? Just the right. table with the yeah. therapeutic recommendations. That's it, where you yeah. Go. All right. So what I wanted to say here is, um, you know, these are these are what I use in my practice um, when I see patients, and basically, I will definitely have, uh, you know, decide if the patient is an acute patient versus a chronic patient because I will choose different medications for these patients. In the acute setting, the, the non-steroidals and the COX-2 inhibitors and even intra-articular corticosteroid injection is a benefit in the acute setting for the patient. But when we, when we deal with sometimes uh, pain of primarily a musculoskeletal origin, if it's still within the, the, the acute setting, I will then uh, also ask the, the um, with pain, with um, physical med with medication, like muscle relaxation, I also ask my um, physiotherapist to assist me. If it comes to a patient that has chronic pain, um, the, I, I normally do not uh, uh, prescribe non-steroidals for them because they are a, a different type of patient and their pain pathways is very really different than, uh, from the, a patient that's got an acute problem. And there, I will, I will, I will have a, a very short period where I will prescribe maybe benzos, antidepressant, uh, anticonvulsant, or even other medication. But this I will do in conjunction with, uh, uh, with my pain uh, clinic team members that includes a neurologist and an anesthetist specialist that deals with, with pain medication. Um, and sometimes, you know, when the patient comes back, the patient informs you that the medication did not work. Um, don't be despondent, you know, go back and sit down with the patient and, and go back to your, to your accuracy of your diagnosis. Maybe you are missing something. Maybe the patient did not inform you about everything. Go back to your, to your paperwork, go back to factors that, that might contribute or, or might um, impact your treatment if, if you choose the pharmacology way. And also the efficacy of your treatment, you need to know uh, if you prescribe medication, what the medication is doing to the patient and what exactly and where exactly you want to, that medication to work. Also compliance of the patient. You know, uh, many a times you ask the patient, show me your medication, how much is left? And you say, but I've given you 10, you brought eight back. How did you use that two medication? and you will get very funny stories from the compliance of the patient is also important. Also be aware that sometimes if you prescribe these opiates, um, the overuse of the medication and the patient um, telling you that they need something stronger, it's working a little bit, but please give it more and more. Please be careful what you do prescribe to this patient. Also patient that's got sleep uh, disorders um, and, and these patients, um, also, with their medication, I've seen that this patient does not do well with uh, medication if you, if you prescribe your, your, your medication prescribed for acute problems. They might need something that's more in the chronic uh, arena patients. Um, then also, like I said, be careful for the patient that, that, that suffers from anxiety and depression um, because medication might can be beneficial to them but can also be detrimental to them moving away from 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 medication you can um, offer the patient physical treatment um, and that uh, is either a home treatment program that you can you can discuss with your patient you know limit them to jaw movement in some ways is even even um, control passive motion devices that you can buy, uh, like the terabyte that can assist the patient with jaw opening exercises. 
but most of the time I do send my patient for physical therapy um, 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 as part of our, of our clinic that we've got. And there is, very, there is a lot of, of exercise programs that we've got um, that you can discuss with the patient and they can perform these exercises at home, um, positioning of the tongue, control moving the TMJ rotation, standing in front of the mirror and doing all these exercises. So there's a lot of exercises that you can present to these patients. If you come to splint therapy, um, this is the one that most of us uh, prescribe to the patient. Um, but I'm always, uh, you know, a little bit confused if, if there is so many temporomandibular disorders around, with so many diagnostic uh, criteria around, why do all of them get uh, a bite splint? Um, so we need to be a little bit more cognizant in who we give bite splints to. And, and I tried to break it down. These are the patients that I normally will, 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 will provide a bite splint for. And it's basically for any condition that either it's got a, a, a it's very good for, for if, it's, if, if the origin of the, the, the pain is focused on muscle disorders or an inflammatory intraarticular problem then bite splint therapy uh, works very well. But if you're looking at how I underline those yellow areas, you can see all these patients, if you have your intraoral examination, shows features of either clenching or bruxism. And as I've informed you earlier, you know, bruxism is not a dental issue. It's a dental manifestation of a clinical issue, of a medical issue. So these patients, um, it will help them if, if there is input from either um, a neurologist or a, 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 a pain specialist um, to assist you with, with, with managing these patients because they are chronic sufferers. But bite splint therapy works well in some of these uh, conditions that I've got here. Some of the key points um, that oral appliances uh, that I use, uh, let me just put this. Uh, oral appliances forms part of your conservative treatment uh, for certain patients with, with temporal mandibular disorders, and not all of them. The, the design of these oral appliances depends basically on your clinical objectives, what you want to achieve from this, and we'll touch on it now. Um, but the mechanism of, of, of action underlying these clinical effects of these oral appliances is not completely understood. And um, the problem that I, I, I see in my clinic with patients that have prolonged use of various oral appliances is when it produces permanent changes to the mandibular position and or the occlusion. And then these patients needs very advanced um, um, on TMD treatments. When you classify appliances, you get three, three types. Basically, they fall under these three types. It's either complete coverage, parcel coverage, or mandibular repositioning devices. I make use of the complete coverage, stabilizing appliances that covers all the teeth in one arch, and it doesn't lock the patient in into, into one type of occlusion. Your mandibular reposition devices I do use in certain circumstances, but I wean them off it and then eventually I change over to a complete cover stabilizing appliances. But all of these appliances is controversial. And the research behind all these appliances, although it's been there for many years, it's very weak, weak research. It's, 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 it's mostly expert opinions, uh, small cohort of patients. The diagnosis is not is not um, is not all uh, based on the the diagnostic criteria of temporal mandibular disorders. So it's only expert opinions, and the research on it is is not great. But it works for a certain 
type of patients. The published analytical reviews of oral appliances does not support the use of oral appliances. So in a nutshell, in conclusion, the efficacy of oral appliances is still very much controversial. This is how I use uh, splints, um, the muscle disorder, the disc displacement and the joint infl inflammatory conditions, all of them end up eventually in the flat plane appliances that the patients use. In very short period of time, I can have an anterior bike plane appliances made for the patient. And this is in the muscle dust disorders, especially with the headache ones, when you just want to position the mandible forward when there's an inflammatory intraarticular condition associated with the muscle disorders. An anterior bite plane appliance does work. Also in the walkie stool, I use it and when there is severe joint inflammation and there might be cost implication or the patient's um, um, factors uh, does not allow me to do arthrosynthesis or, or, or any other procedure. Uh, anterior repositioning appliances works very well. What about Botox? Everybody's giving Botox for, 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 for myofascial pain syndrome. Well, Botox treat the symptoms. Botox for me is never the only treatment for uh, temporal mandibular disorders but it can assist in managing the contributing factors like muscle spasms, like overuse of these muscles. You can reduce that by providing the patient with Botox. I sometimes use Botox with splint therapy and it works very well, um, but I will always start then with splint therapy first and tell the patient that he might benefit from from Botox. Um, in an article by Laskin, you know, uh, you know, when they were saying what is Botox is the treatment of choice uh, because it treats the etiology. This is not true because, um, you know, if one of the theories is if you have MPS, you have muscle hyperactivity. If that was not all studies says there is an increase in activity, but if it was, then Botox is great. Botox causes muscle paralysis. Therefore, Botox work. If, if muscle hyperactivity is, is present with the patient of MPS. What about inflammation? Well, we know if, if you can reduce the inflammation, uh, muscle activity, you then therefore reduce inflammation. And if you introduce this inflammation, you can increase range of movement. Well, Botox also tick that box because Botox have also an analgesic effect by blocking action of neurotransmitters in the muscles. But there is also very little evidence that MPS is, co is caused in its, in its initial phase by inflammation, but Botox can work. If it comes to parafunctional habits and trigger points, we do have other conservative management that we can use that is much more cost effective than Botox. Um, so I would not recommend Botox to treat parafunctional habits or for trigger points alone, because sometimes like dry needling can be used also to manage these trigger points. Another non-surgical intervention is low-level laser therapy. Um, it's very effective in reducing pain. Um, it's got a pain relieving effect. It's got accelerated tissue regeneration. It's a great way of managing patient pain uh, before as a conservative management, also post-operative. The problem that we have or the controversies we have, there is no standardization of the param parameters. And, and therefore we should look at these uh, interpretation of the results with caution. Um, but uh, my recommendation is here is to, is to follow the manufacturer's recommendation and I think there is still a lot of stuff to achieve by low level laser therapy as a conservative treatment. What about biobehavioral therapy? This is, this is where, 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 where we as TMD clinicians, we come to see how important the patient psychological um, profile is because we will see 
same patient, same diagnosis, same radiological image. We give them a treatment protocol and the outcome is different. Why is the outcome different? Because within a given range of clinical symptoms, there may be a wide range of psychosocial functioning. And we should not ignore the patient uh, psychological status. We should not ignore the influence of patient psychological status on our treatment and also the interaction between environmental factors. <clears throat> so if you want to have a successful treatment in patients that's got an underlying psycho psychological or psychosocial problem, you know, you need to positively conceptualize the patient's needs. Um, what do you want to get out of the treatment? How are you going to achieve it? How the patient needs to assist you to achieve this? Acknowledge that there's a, not only a biological problem, but the patient's also got a, a mind-body relations and that the patient needs to acknowledge that, that, that he might require um, the, the need to, to speak to somebody else and not only to the dentist or the surgeon or the, or the pain specialist, he might also need a psychiatrist to have a look at him to manage uh, part of what's going on in his life and develop a collaborative relationship with various specialities that can assist with this patient. And these various treatment approaches to assist us with this counseling, biofeedback, uh, self-monitoring, psychotherapy, hypnosis, all these treatment approaches for a small part of patients is beneficial to them. Now, a very small part will come for arthroscopy or arthrosynthesis, you know, when conservative management have failed. And when you look down uh, arthroscope, this is what we can see. We can see perforation of the disc, we can see adhesions, we can see synovitis and chondromalacia, all these factors, um, all these conditions we can see and we can manage and, and assist us even with the diagnosis if we are still not sure about the diagnosis, especially perforation of the disc, you know, even on the MRI scan. Um, it's sometimes not clear that the disc is perforated, but when we put a scope in, we can definitely see there's a perforated disc. And then therefore we can also then um, have a treatment um, protocol for these type of patients. Um, arthros arthroscopy, arthrosynthesis, uh, does, they do very well in a Wilkes 2-3 uh, setup. And yeah, this is the patient that's got the occasional painful clicking joint a uh, little bit of, of, of locking maybe. Um, if you're looking at, at the MRI scan, it's slight or maybe a full anterior disc displacement with or without reduction, but there is no degenerative features within the condyle or no advanced degenerative features in the condyle. Those do, they do very well with arthrosynthesis and arthroscopy, even in the acute setting. I nowadays take patients with an acute TMD very early to theatre and do arthrosynthesis and then continue with conservative management. A study that was published recently looked at different treatment um, um, options for the TMD. And yeah, um, and this is a, a randomized looking at different studies and putting them all together. And arthrosynthesis and arthroscopy scored very high. Um, and, and this, it looks like this should be now not a, if non-surgical procedures fail, then do arth arthroscopy or arthrosynthesis. It, it looks like we should introduce arthrosynthesis and arthroscopy very early in the acute setting after making a, a diagnosis uh, that can benefit the patient um, and then continue with non-surgical intervention. Then there is open joint surgery. Um, not a lot of patients get to this phase, but we can do a lot of stuff. We can do disc repositioning surgeries. We can do disc removal surgeries when the patient presents with a perforation. We can, if we remove the disc, we can, we can put something back in there 
or, or latest nowadays we do don't put anything in but we follow a strict um, um, physical therapy protocol in our in our clinic and we, we, we get in good results and eventually if 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 the disc the condyle the fossa eminence component and the patient's got in stage TMJ condition, then we do a joint replacement surgery for them. So in summary, um, I want to stress that the diagnosis is important. Take your time in the history, in your clinical examination, both from, from a biological point of view and a psychosocial point of view, do the appropriate investigations and get to a diagnosis. Your treatment, should have a non-surgical component to it and choose your non-surgical component, your, your treatment carefully, uh, make it individualized to the patient and his condition. And if all things failed and the patient will benefit from surgery, refer to a maxillofacial surgeon. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation, Dr. Mayer. Um, there have been some questions and comments. I think let's start going through them one by one and we take it from there. Okay. So first question, what bite splint do you recommend for bruxism not to treat TMD? All right, when it, when it comes to, um, to bite splints, um, I think there's various studies depending on, 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 on which article you prescribe to. But I make use of two types. It's either the Michigan, the old school Michigan bite splint, or nowadays uh, also the dual laminated uh, bite splint therapy that's got a hard surface on the outer shell and a softer surface on the inner cell. Um, I, you also need to, you know, to look if the patient is predominantly a clincher or is the patient predominantly a braxa. Um, but those would be the two. Um, 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 bite splint therapies that I use and both of them is showing almost equal uh, results in patients with bruxism or, um, or clenching. Okay, our next question, should dentists be taught how to undertake physiotherapy of the orofacial muscles at dental schools? Physiotherapy has helped in many cases of TMD problems. Well, there is, you know, I think, I think physiotherapy is, only, is not only about manual manipulation. I think that um, we can achieve because we know the anatomy very well. Um, but, you know, they, only, they also make use of, any, of, of other stuff like dry needling, like uh, heat sources, you know, stuff that I just go and have a look at. And I'm amazed with, with, with the equipment that they've got to assist them or to get deeper penetration of some of the, of the, of the stuff that they are doing. So yes, it can be taught. Um, you know, um, I wasn't taught it, but uh, it's, it's sometimes very easy exercises that you can ask your patient to do. And like I have in my presentations, you know, there is exercises that you can ask the patient to do. Um, but nothing to take away from the physiotherapist. There is a place for them in our, um, in our collaboration when we see these patients. Okay, our next question. What thickness is your anterior bite plate? Yeah, thickness. Uh, one of the studies uh, looked at thickness of bite splint. And it seems like anything between two to four millimeters depending on the patient's type of occlusion is of benefit. Um, uh, you know, looking at, at, at thickness alone, but uh, with thickness alone comes various other stuff. You need to look at, you know, if you're looking at radiologically, there was always a discussion, can you reposition the disc with a thicker bite splint? Um, and that study is, um, is inconclusive. Or, or even negative, they say that they can't. But thickness, the overall thickness uh, with a, a positive outcome to patient between two to four millimeters. 
Okay, our next question. Do you think breathing problems, patency of the airway, posture, sleep apnea, play a part in TMD problems? Yes. Yes, I did not touch on that because that is beyond my scope of practice. But yes, I do see that. And, and, and that is normally discussed uh, with my ENT colleagues. Uh, sleep studies is done. And yes, that this patient, these are the chronic patients that I'm talking about. They've got chronic pain issues. And bite splint alone, that bite splint definitely don't work for them. Um, um, they are managed a little bit differently than, than, than those patients. But they are, um, that is a speciality on its own sleep medicine and, and TMD problems. Okay, our next question may jump on some toes, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Mm -hmm. Are orthodontists in the front line for causing long-term TMD problems? Oh, yeah, that, that's a controversial issue. You know, that is, that is, that is reading the literature of, of, of orthodontics and lately reading the literature of, 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 of TMD versus leading the literature on, on, uh, on MaxFact, you know, uh, you know, that is, that's almost an exam question. <laughs> so it's basically a yes and no from my part. Um, let me, let me, let me rather rephrase this and say, if I do see a patient that present with a malocclusion and a TMD problem. What do I do in my practice? There's two school of thoughts. The one school of thought that I follow is that I fix the TMD issue first, and then I address the malocclusion. The other school of thought that some of us also do is to address both simultaneously is repositioning and normally it's, it's, it's an internal derangement problem, uh, repositioning the disc and then also doing the advancement of, of, of the uh, occlusion. Um, but yes, that, that verdict is not out yet. It's, it's, I think, I think you, you need to, to, to look at where it's coming from, the theories that's behind that, like I, like I discussed earlier, and how we evolved over time with, with not being stuck to those theories alone. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't have an answer for that. Okay, moving on, our next question. It is becoming commonplace in private practice to operate in practice, sorry, to reestablish vertical dimensions to enable us to reconstruct worn dentition. How does this impact the TMJ? Look, one thing that I've seen and, 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 and the studies is supporting this and even in my own research is supporting this. I wonder, I, I, I might have to rephrase this. Um, um, this is two parts here. My, my first thing is why is the patient having a wound dentition? So then it becomes a bruxism issue and that is loss of vertical dimension. So that can be managed and that can then cause uh, TMD issues. So I think that we addressed in, in, in my discussion, you know, one decision, that's why the history is, why do you have a one decision? And if you're looking at, 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 um, at bruxism as a cause, we need to address that as part of our treatment phase. Um, so just putting, bringing that vertical height back, uh, if I just talk to my dentist colleagues, you know, and you do not address bruxism, that patient will, 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 will wear through that dentition very quickly again. Another aspect is, is in when you have loss of vertical dimension, if you're looking at the older population that I also see, they don't have the problem of disc displacement and temporal mandibular disorders as what we would think they will have because they have no occlusion. So, um, you know, that's where my genetic stuff, my genetic studies also come in, is there's much more than occlusion when we deal with temporal mandibular disorders. Okay, there's been a comment relating to our previous question. 
I'm just going to read through and carry on to our next question. The comment is that opera studies have shown that there is a small risk associated to previous orthodontic treatment in developing TMDs. Yes, correct. The opera study has shown that, especially um, in, 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 in your class twos. Um, or that's what I also see in my practice, that the class twos, they have a higher incidence of TMD issues um, um, than others. Um, again, from my perspective as, 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 as a surgery, surgery um, you know, I go back to, you know, what do I manage first? And I manage the joint conditions first. Uh, but yes, the opera studies have shown, and though are they, these are really good studies, that this, it's, it's, it's a small risk associated with orthodontic treatment. Um, but which one? The verdict is not out. But in my, uh, in, in, in my own practice, uh, I, I think the, the class twos, I would be very careful if they present with a pre-existing TMJ problem then just to start with orthodontic treatment with them. They, meet, they might need orthodontics and surgery um, to have a better outcome for them. Okay, our next um, comment in question. Good evening, thank you for the webinar. It is very informative. My question is, if a patient presents to you with signs of bruxing, the patient also presents with red irritating eyes, as well as presenting with maxillary sinus fluid bilaterally in both maxillary sinus okay, I'm, I'm, and PNRX. Dr. Yira, I'm, I'm, I'm losing you there. symptoms of sinusitis. Dr. Okay, Yira, let's start I, again. Yes, let's start again. If a patient presents to you with signs of bruxing, the patient also presents with red irritating eyes, as well as presenting with maxillary sinus fluid bilaterally in both maxillary sinuses on Penelex X-ray, and the patient has symptoms of sinusitis. Are these signs and symptoms correlated to bruxing habit? From, I actually, we, we do see these patients, all right? Um, the eyes, the sinus, the sinusitis, um, you know, we, we've, we've managed this uh, with my ENT colleagues, you need to, and most of the time, we get two separate diagnoses here. The runny eyes, the sinus problems, um, the sinus congestions, it's got to do with the sinus problems, either a drainage problem, or but it's, it's within the field of ENT. Uh, the bruxism, um, like I said, can be, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dental manifestation of a medical problem. But most of the time, the bruxism is not a, a, a ENT or sinus issues. Uh, most of those patients um, have some sort of a, 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 a psychosocial issue and bruxism in the literature now is considered more as a central uh, problem than um, looking only at teeth. And, and, a, and looking for an anatomical reason why the patient is bruxism. Okay. Is the modern indolent, inactive, modern child's lifestyle a precursor for TMD in years to come? And should, this, or should there be a category called Netflix or TV gaming TMD in future classifications? I've got no answer to that. Um, maybe another study that somebody can do. Um, look, if you, yeah, I don't have an answer for that. Um, what is the future health for our kids that's the whole time uh, um, looking down or looking up to a screen? But, um, you know, I can, I can only contribute that to, in my history, you know, when did this thing start? What do you do often? Because what we see, if you're looking at, at, at occupational problem, is the patient that is a receptionist coming to you with TMD problem, and eventually you find out it's actually neck stiffness because he's keeping the phone the whole time on the side. Um, that might be something that I will look at is, 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 is positional problem. 
And with my clinical examination, I might find that it's more a muscular problem than an intra-articular problem with these type of, 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 of children for the future. I guess time will tell. Time will tell. Our next, <laughs> yep. Our next comment and question. Thank you for the informative presentation, Dr. Mayer. Thank you. Dr. Hira, are you still there? Dr. Mayer, just please follow yes. the Q&A at the bottom of the screen um, and you will be able to see the, the questions from our delegates. Yes. I think uh, the question, do lasers have a role to play in treating TMD? I do, did answer that. Dr. Where May, do I'm you back again. The... Sorry? Dr. I'm Yira, back you're back? In, I... Yeah, I'm back again, but I've lost the questions on my end. All right. So I will just try to go through them quickly. Uh, this is Dr. Vedetsky that's asking about lasers. I think I asked you that one. He also asked, where do you inject the Botox and how much do you inject? Well, uh, I normally just inject Botox in the masseters and temporalis muscles and normally around about 20 units a side. Um, uh, you can go up to 30 units depending on the patient, but I give the first dose around about 20, 25 units um and then i follow them up two weeks later and uh and they might need a, a top up uh, two months later two or three months later um then uh anonymous uh, doctor i i do separate cleansing and bruxism yes um, uh, you're under the impression that cleansing was a form of bruxism. Yes, you can, you can, you can look at that if you're looking at the muscle activity. Uh, bruxism is a rotational force, so there's much more movement involved. Uh, where cleansing is a compression force, um, a prolonged compression force. I have seen that the, the clinches. Uh, uh, is worse off than the bruxes, um, although the dentition for the bruxes is, is, does not look too great. Um, but yes, I do separate them um, in my treatment as well um, from clenching and bruxism. And I don't, okay, here's more. What is the prediction among male and female ratio of TMJ disorders? Uh, I, most of my patient, uh, I think it's probably 80% of my patients is females. And any suggestion, advice on hormone replacement therapy in TMJ disorders? Uh, at this stage, no studies are, are conclusive of hormone replacement therapy in TMJ although a lot of research is done on receptors that is found in the TMJ. And that is something to look forward to, uh, especially in delivering those intra-articular uh, medications to directly to, to the joint. But at this stage, no, no hormone replacement therapy. Um, another, uh, does Dr. Mayer find that anterior partial covered butt splints work better for clenches? Uh, like I said in my presentation, uh, I do not offer partial coverage splints for my patients. Uh, um, these splints I actually find to be, uh, if used long term, to be detrimental to patients because they do cause permanent occlusion changes within those patients. 
And Dr. Hira, I don't find anything else here. I think there's, there's one more question which I've just found in the chat. Okay. It asks, do you recommend the use of topical steroid injections? Um, I've got no experience in topical steroid injections. Um, uh, I've only got experience in, in intra-articular injections. But what I've seen is that my physiotherapists, have, they've got a means of, of post, my, my post-surgical patients that they do have a topical steroid, but they have a delivery system to it that brings that without the use of a needle much deeper to, to where I want the topical to be used. But I only use intra-articular injections and not topical uh, injections. Okay, then we have a question from Dr. Mukan. Can vitamin D deficiency and other nutritional deficiencies like vitamin B12, B6 or B2 cause problems like joint pain? And she goes further to ask about menopause being a potential factor as well. Um, I do not have a lot of information regarding that, but our patient that's treated by the physicians or, or the pain specialists, they do a whole panel of, 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 of blood tests, but it's not um, directive to the patient presenting with temporal mandibular disorders. It's normally the, um, the patient that presents at the pain clinic. Um, I haven't seen that any of those deficiencies um, at this stage uh, is a direct contributing factor to developing temporal mandibular disorders. Although when you do prescribe some pharmacological agents, um, you know, it can interfere with what the patient is using, um, like um, a substitute and all that stuff. But in my practice, I do not see a correlation at this stage. Menopause, um, I've seen it a lot in, in, in females. Again, it's back to does hormones play a role in patients developing TMD? Uh, literally say yes, um, um, but the direct impact of it um, and, and how we can use that to treat the patient is still out. We don't know yet. Anything else? One more question I see. Should we be concerned when parents inform us of their toddlers or small kids grinding at night? Yeah, that's 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 actually a question that I see that see I see daily. And um, the issue normally is um, the literature says that, that, that most of them will grow out of it. Um, but I haven't seen, or maybe I don't see a lot of these children, and that I can confess, I don't see a lot of these, these kids. I haven't seen the detrimental effect of that type of bruxism or clenching on the temporal mandibular joint. Um, you know, there hasn't been studies to show that uh, this child was bruxisming for a, a number of years and look at what has happened to his conduct. I have not seen that in an isolated bruxism case. It's a different story if the patient is a, a autoimmune disorder or anything like that. But from an isolated toddler's um, grinding at night, I also would not recommend them having bite splints made, et cetera, because that will have a restrictive force on the growing child. Dr. Mayer, from what I can see on my end, that was the last question. Thank you so much for your great presentation. I think everyone appreciated the informative presentation. Thank you. One last announcement from my end. Please, for everyone to be aware that the next webinar will be on the 16th of November, which will be Mouth Cancer Awareness, uh, Mouth Cancer Awareness Webinar by Professor Neil Wood. 
please remember to complete the evaluation after the webinar. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much for everyone for attending and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. And thank you, delegates. Good night.